Trend number four for the past decade, uh, four of five, that uh, that the, you again you'll be expanding on in your article um, when it is released, but that, that that we wanted to to expand on here as well is metal detecting, uh, and more to the point, even though because this is this has been a hobby that's been going on for a long time, specifically yeah. the growth of the culture and the the or the gatherings known as metal detecting rallies in the past decade or yeah. so. Uh, can you take take this away, please? Because I'm not I'm not sure I, I I know what quite where to begin. So go go ahead. Okay. Oh, five metal detecting <laughs> on archaeological <laughs> metal detecting on, on archaeological sites has been and, and, and metal detectors cooperating with archaeologists has been going on since the 1970s at least. Now I, again, I remember the very first site I worked on in uh, rural Kent. We were working with a couple of local metal detectors who were uh, uh, who were. Uh, doing the field walking with the, the archaeologists. Mm -hmm. So I'm not anti-metal detectoring per se. Please, metal detectorists who are watching this, I do not, you know, I do not want to take your metal detectors off you and smash them over my knee. <laughs> um, which was no. the way archaeology greeted it, uh, greeted the hobby initially when yeah. uh, in the 1970s, yeah. early 1980s. Yeah. Now, after a lot of blood and treasure and anger and emotion was spent um two things happened in the 1990s we had the treasures act passed which uh formalized the recording process for uh certainly material um containing a, a, an element of precious metals but also um things like hoards so that even a, a hoard of bronze coins with no precious metals would be regarded as treasure other unusual objects uh, can be regarded as treasure uh, archaeological objects rather can be can be regarded as treasure and and, and so on it's just too complicated to go into the whole lot and all, all the aspects of it now but basically it imposed some legal obligations on any finder of treasure but uh, particularly obviously metal detectors as they were the most likely to come across this kind of mm. material in the course of their activities mm -hmm. um on the back of that too, to pick up this, fill the gap between the material uh, that was uh, reportable under the Treasure Act and the uh, rest of the archaeological record that was turning up in metal detectors, uh, uh, you know, uh, finds buckets, um, the Portable Antiquities Scheme came into being, which was a series of regional officers called Finds Liaison Officers Flows who were there to work in two directions. They were there to report and re record and report nationally finds that were declared to them by metal detectorists voluntarily. It's not mm -hmm. compulsory. Mm -hmm. um, and also to reach out to metal detectorists as individuals and clubs to work with them to make, uh, to try and show them the, how, um, their work, their hobby, could actually enhance archaeology and to get them to uh, improve their standards of recording uh, and reporting and, um, and and how to recognise finds that they really should leave alone and call in the professionals to, to look at before they were damaged. Mm. This was highly controversial because of part of this system, uh, there was also a system of financial rewards under the Treasure Act um, for a uh, split between the landowner and the finder, um, the, which basically equated the, to the commercial auction value of the find yeah. that they declared. And this is this is something that, that, that I I frequently get asked questions about, especially by archaeologists who are based in Europe uh, or the US, etc. Where uh, yeah. essentially, why do we encourage encourage metal detecting by allowing people to profit from it? Now, now uh, we'll come back to that the, the the argument against that in 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 the in the, the second half of this. But go ahead. Yeah, right. Now the situation with rallies in particular is something that has come about really in the last few years. It wasn't a, a major issue for many many years, but people have started to see the basically to be frank the opportunity to make a buck. Yeah. Sometimes to make a buck for charity. Sometimes to make a buck for themselves. Mm -hmm. What they do is get a permission from a landowner. They um, then uh, 
supply some infrastructure like some loos, maybe hire a barbecue, whatever, pay people 20 quid for the weekend to come along and detect, mm -hmm. and it's all comers. Now, these uh, these activities fall into a legal grey area in terms of third party insurance. They fall into a legal grey area in terms of declaring taxable income. Mm -hmm. They fall into a legal grey area in terms of the um, the, the, the organisation. For example, you know, it, it is not a legal obligation to declare the fact that a rally is going on, whereas if you're having a concert in the same field, you'd have to declare and get a, a temporary events notice from the local council, mm -hmm. um, which will cover things like health and safety, uh, issues around parking and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the, um, the, 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 those are, there, there are those issues even before you start looking at the amount of material that can be hauled out of the ground. And discounting the accusations, for example, that some organisers go over the ground first to make sure that there aren't any real goodies there um, before the rest of the um, detectorists are allowed to move in. Um, the idea is that you know, 100 detectorists to turn, uh, you know, 100 detectorists turning up for a weekend on a you know, 10 acres in rural Lincolnshire or Wiltshire or wherever effectively amounts to strip mining the area of its archaeology, yeah. of, its, of its portable archaeology. And, and, and the other, and, and the problem is that those sorts of numbers as well, plus the fact that they occur at weekends and often many weekends through the d detecting season, uh, it overwhelms the ability of the finance liaison officers to actually record the archaeology. Yeah. So yeah. indeed, indeed, we, indeed, indeed, we both we have both seen uh, examples where where FLOs are actively uh, being misled or being dis dis. dis Essentially, not being informed, shall we say? Well, but there, was an, there was an article we, we discussed the uh, the all canning situation uh, last autumn, and I'm about to publish an article about it. Um, but basically, there was a metal detecting rally that was organised through a closed WhatsApp group, uh, sorry, Facebook group, um, which the local county archaeologists only found out about because one of the people in that group actually informed them because they thought what was going on shouldn't go on. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So five minutes and a bit on on that but i think it was worthwhile laying that out because it is it is a it's definitely been a, a growth a cultural thing it's a, well, a cultural phenomenon in in mm. the, in that subculture uh and on the one hand it has it has a veneer of positivity it's definitely it's probably a good it's probably good fun i imagine to be at one well but, you know any any yeah. collective event when you get together with your friends and so on is um it, it, it is it, it is fun we you know we go we go to watch sport with our friends and yeah. family and so on, we, we can do this kind of thing. Yeah. Nothing, nothing wrong with that. No. Um, but it's the it's the way it's done and the, and, 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 the, and the quantity and the quantity of material. Uh, you know, uh, that, that's that's where the issue lies. And 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 and, and the fact that some of the, the, the often the people behind it have a commercial interest in promoting the maximum possible take up. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, the, the, but but the the flip side of that, what could possibly be the flip side of that? I hear you cry, uh, is something that I hinted at, and that is, uh, for a start, the volume of material uh, as recorded in the Portable Antiquities Scheme. Now, I've just checked, and currently, uh, so as of uh, the seventh of January, twenty twenty, uh, yeah. there are one point four seven zero three four two. Uh, million objects in the library in 940,015 records. Uh, yeah. That's a lot. Uh, so given that, the, that there was a pilot scheme in 97, I believe, and the first record was made in 1998. So hmm. just just over a decade. Um, no, so just over two decades. Sorry. Two decades. Two yeah, decades. Years. Oh, sorry, yeah. two decades. Uh, what we have seen is uh, is one and a half million objects recovered and actually so the reason why i said just over a decade is that also earlier uh, a couple of years ago earlier this uh, this past decade no late this past decade early th anyway a couple of a couple of years ago there was a report on the past decade of the pas i think into 2018 i think mm -hmm. uh, where they said actually that the the rate of fines has been going up and up and up presumably because more and more people have access to high high capacity metal detecting equipment so so that's a positive in so much as that material previously uh whether for, for good or bad reasons for positive or negative reasons either might not have been recovered or found because it was just too deep or uh, it would have found its way into uh into 
black markets and 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 less less um essentially we wouldn't have had access to the to the objects we wouldn't have known where they were coming from they would have been as uh, flinders petrie i do believe once said uh they would have essentially been rendered dead artifacts uh he used yeah. to i think his quote is that uh, uh a curiosity cabinet is a a, a charnel house of of uh, dead artifactual remains because we don't know where they're from so the stories that they tell have been captured in the Baltimore antiquity scheme as well and so in answer to that that question that, that we're so often asked from by archaeologists for example in uh, in greece and italy this kind of thing france um why do we allow this well the answer is it happens anyway the portable antiquities scheme is the means by which we're able to to a certain extent actually quantify what's happening uh, but also actually make sure that, that we're not losing all of that information and all those stories and um, one of the notes that we've got here uh, for this 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 counterpoint on the trend is that arguably a more generalized sense of history and archaeology as a resource beneath our feet has also come about in the past decade the the uh, the very fact and um, and it's first i think fair to say the very fact that we have a very popular tv series called detectorists in the uk is something which which a lot of archaeologists i know take a lot of pleasure in they actually quite enjoy watching it now for my to my mind i get slightly frustrated when they use terminology along the lines of prize money and when they when they they do slightly crassly talk about the objects and artifacts that they're finding but that's just realistic people in these communities yeah. will get excited about finding something that that's worth something of course they will who wouldn't but i like the fact that arguably the fact that detectorists exists a little bit like time time team before it is adding to the generalized notion in uh you know on a on a on a you know a cultural sort of subconscious level that archaeology mm. is all around us and it is uh it is there as a resource and, and hopefully the next the next bit of learning that people have is that it's a resource that's worthwhile protecting that no, and, and that's why I'd like to just jump in for a second with a, with, with a point. I think archaeologists have to be absolutely frank, as we're constantly being reminded actually by um, some metal detectorists. But you know, the origins of archaeology are very similar to the origins of metal detecting. It was about collecting. It was about collecting for individual collections, mm -hmm. and then those individual collections sometimes morphed into museums, or they ended up in you know, as you say, they ended up in the cabinet of curiosities. Um, uh, I'm sure we can all think of examples when, for example, uh, a, a leading member of a local archaeological society passes away and their personal collection of documents or artefacts uh, becomes an issue. Mm -hmm. Does it get, does it stay with the family? Does it get put on eBay? Does it get binned? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, because people don't recognise what it is. Yeah. Um, you know, and these are these aren't new issues. This has been going on for many, many years. So uh, metal detecting is unfair to in all of this on metal detectorists. Well, in the end, that sense, I suppose metal detecting is, to a certain extent, the um, uh, antiques roadshow of its Pre of its day, to a certain extent. Pre isn't it? Pre yeah. Precisely. Yeah. Now, again, I mean, some people would argue. Um, I might argue, if we were arguing this out with some metal detectorists, that in the same way that antiquarianism grew up and became archaeology, metal detecting needs to grow up if it's going to take itself uh, 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 and um, become a part of archaeology in a more formal way for example through licensing through an enforceable code of practice and through compulsory recording yeah um because it's uh, because it's a it's a finite environmental resource that they're dealing with yeah well and, and a point i suppose that you, that you that you made similar to this in our notes uh is that uh in doing so and this actually ties in with the counterpoint to trend number two that we identified um mm -hmm in having a slightly more formal structure and working within that structure, you mm. discourage the less reputable elements from being involved in that community. Uh, yeah. Particularly, for example, people with strange political or cultural agendas who are trying to use treasures in certain ways, or people who mm. simply want to profit it profit from it in uh, illicit ways for example going to yeah. uh, sites of, of war graves or even war crimes um, mm. a note here that I quite like that we made as well is that it's accessibility as an anti-elitist movement uh, mm. is a good thing the accessibility of a metal detector is excellent in so much as it does help people normal people people who are who have you know, have no training to get involved mm. in this stuff the question is what happens next and and as you say the community needs to take responsibility for that
Yeah, the, the, the analogy I, I, I've been making increasingly with something like fishing, which is a popular working class hobby and has been for many, many, many years and, 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 and upper class as well. Obviously, it, it covers a, a range of participants, but it was seen that, you know, it was, it was a work. It was a way of working class people had of relaxing, taking time out in the open air uh, by a river or a lake and fishing for the pot to make, you know, to, 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 to vary their diet. Yeah. Fishing in this country is licensed. Um, and it's licensed and has been for many, many years because it's a conservation issue. Mm. You don't fish in the breeding season no. uh, where you're going to catch breeding females. Mm. You know, um, well, likewise, same, likewise with shooting same with hunting. As well. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Ex exactly. Mm. And personally, if you look at if you look at if you then look at it, look at metal detecting as an environmental issue, dealing with a finite resource like a species of animal, then uh, logically, there's no reason why it shouldn't face similar relatively light restrictions um, on on where, when or where or how you can do something. Thames mudlarks, for example, uh, and, and, and Thames foreshore permits limit you as to the, the, the depth that you can uh, you can recover material from. Yeah, uh, okay. that's already it's already accepted. Yeah. Uh, and also, actually, on a similar anti elitist note as well, uh, it would this would be an element of the resource uh, being seen as owned by the nation as opposed to for example with fish or red deer or swans being owned by certain aristocrats essentially licenses are often or the queen in place, or the, the queen of swans. indeed um <laughs> Licenses were often put in place to stop people from going on to, or more rather, you could buy licenses from people who own certain land. Yeah. Uh, in this instance, yeah. it would be the people, the people of Britain, our heritage. It'd be like a driving license. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And you're like you're being licensed by uh, us yeah. as a as a cooperative, as, uh, as a country, as a country, yeah. as a cooperative, as a, yeah, as a country. We are a fully autonomous and our coast intercoast commune. <laughs> Now we see the violence inherent in the system. Um, so, uh, well, well, I'm being repressed. <laughs> now, as far by my reckoning, we're only seven minutes behind uh, our schedule. I think we're doing blooming well. I think we should, let's let's run to catch up. Yeah, yeah. 